some of you may be aware of a novel published in 2014 called After by Anna Todd. It's inspired by a Harry Styles fan fiction published on Wattpad of the same name, in which Harry Styles is not the musician we know him as today, but is the hot, abusive boyfriend of our protagonist. Great stuff, honestly. Um, but I want you to imagine a world, right, in which After by Anna Todd, the unedited Wattpad version of, of that story, won <laughs> the Nobel Prize for Literature. In this timeline, there exists Snakes and Earrings by Hitome Kanehara. Hello everyone, welcome back to Neo Yukioe. My name is Holden, and today we're looking at 2003's Akutagawa Prize winner, Snakes and Earrings. For those who don't know, the Akutagawa Prize is actually probably widely considered to be Japan's most prestigious award for literature, kind of like the Miles Franklin Prize that we have in Australia or the Booker Prize in the UK. It's kind of a big deal. So imagine my surprise when I went on to Goodreads and found that this novel, this Akutagawa Prize winner, had a hell of a lot of one-star reviews. So I got interested. I started reading these reviews and they all kind of said the same thing that the novel was try-hard, the writing was cringe, it was trying too hard to be edgy, that kind of thing. And some could say they're being overly critical, but that many people can't be wrong, can they? And they won't. <laughs> I think a lot of that criticism was warranted, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But just like the Wattpad fan fiction that the writing in this novel really reminded me of. There was something captivating about it. Now that I've hopefully got your attention, let's talk a little bit about the plot synopsis. What is this book about, or what happens in it? So right away, this story is very fan fiction. We have our protagonist, who is 19-year-old Louis, named after Louis Vuitton. Interesting. And she's very much weird, you know, she doesn't go to college, she doesn't really have a job, she doesn't really have any goals or ambitions. She really only exists to be this manifestation of the caricature of the good girl gone bad, you know, she's trying to shed her good girl image and she does this by first getting ear gorges, I believe they are called, um, and then she takes it to the next level by getting herself a punk new boyfriend and a brand new tattoo. Now, if you're thinking that this sounds an awfully lot like what a 13 year old thinks is badass or hardcore, you'd be absolutely right and I thought the same thing. But despite it being, yes, cringe, try hard, trying too hard to be cool, all those things that we, we saw in the Goodreads reviews, I didn't hate it. I actually rated it three stars. I thought it was okay. I think just like things like Twilight or One Direction fanfiction, for example, we don't go into it expecting Don Quixote. We know it's gonna be a bit shit. But at the same time, it's got this appeal, right? It entertains you. And that's a good thing. In fact, the only thing that I consider a crime on the author's behalf is being boring. Writing can be bad. I think the quality of the writing is in the eye of the beholder, but if something is boring, it's just boring, and I don't want to be bored. And I wasn't bored reading this novel, actually. I found it was quite well paced, and I was interested in what happened next the whole time. So despite its flaws, it has that going for it. That being said, though, do I recommend it? <laughs> Not really. It's not really a bestseller, the same way Twilight is. Like, you can put up with the bad writing in Twilight because it's popular and you have something to kind of talk to people at school about because everyone's read it. And, you know, as far as One Direction fan fiction goes, well, at least you're already a fan of One Direction to begin with, so you can put up with the bad writing because, well, you like <laughs> the concept, you like the characters involved. But with this, I mean, it wasn't a bestseller, it was a prize winner. But that's the weird thing, isn't it? It was a prize winner. It was the Akutagawa prize winner. And it's really shit. And because it's so shit, I don't actually have an analysis for you. There are some open access papers about Snakes and Earrings, actually. So if you are interested, like, there's plenty out there that you can read. But I don't have anything to say about it. 
like I don't have this great theory about how this is actually this allegory for modern feminism in Japan or anything like that. I my head is completely empty. So there's not going to be an analysis section of this video. It's just going to be critique. And I think the most obvious place to start with the critique is the translation because the translation is insane. The challenge I am faced with is I don't know to what extent the translator has butchered the story or to what extent the author just didn't have a very good story to begin with or wasn't able to really express themselves quite well in writing. Because let's be real, like the Akutagawa Prize, it won that. Perhaps in Japanese this novel reads beautifully. It tackles this really quite <laughs> delicate and at times problematic subject matter with grace and it's just the English version that is the train wreck. But can I really put that much pressure or, you know, on the translator? Is this really all his fault? Can I really say that just because she won the Akutagawa Prize, Kanehara is an amazing writer? I can't. I, I can't even really make much of a judgment on the writing of the original manuscript at all. I haven't read it. But at the same time, this version that I read was translated by David Karashima, and he's not an amateur. He's done many books. He's written many books. He's translated many books. He's a professor of creative writing at the University of Tokyo. So I don't think it's anyone's particular blame. I, I think they both kind of messed up somewhere. And what has kind of come together is a story that, although is entertaining, um, is very much overshadowed by its technical errors. What do I mean by technical errors? Well, the first thing I want to mention is something called localization. You know when you use Google Translate and the sentence that they spit out is sometimes super bizarre? Well, it's because things like grammar and nuance are not considered. You're really getting the most basic textbook one-to-one -one translation of each word that is put in. There's no consideration for the context in which that was used and the context of the person receiving that translation. It's all done by AI. So when a human being is translating something from one language to another, we expect them to consider things like context and nuance and cultural differences in order to provide the best translation possible. But sometimes that falls a little bit short and sometimes that is due to literally being too exact with the translation instead of trying to fit what is basically said into a more appropriate sentence for the audience. I think there's a few occasions in which this happens and it made me laugh every time. And these kind of awkward lines always just stuck in my mind and kind of distracted me from the story. The same way that any awkward line in any otherwise okay novel is gonna <laughs> stick out. And I'm sure David Karashima has, you know, more than a basic understanding of English. I know he's written books in English. He should have quite a diverse and, and wide and varied English vocabulary. But sometimes the things that he writes makes it look like he doesn't. Here's an example of a conversation in the novel that is just really doesn't translate to a Western English speaking audience because the vocabulary isn't correct. It may be like the most accurate translation, but it just... It, it gives off an, the wrong impression. This is a conversation between protagonist Louis and her boyfriend Amma after they've had intercourse for the first time. No, actually, I'm still a minor, he replied, looking me straight in the eyes. I felt myself starting to run out of patience and wondering why I even bothered worrying about him. Didn't want you to think I was a kid. I kind of dropped that on you out of the blue, didn't I? Should I have broken it to you more seriously? How old are you anyway? How rude can you get? I'm still a minor too. You're kidding, said Arma, opening his eyes wide. You serious? Well, that's perfect. He smiled from ear to ear and gave me a hug. So you may have guessed what part of this is weird. Um, and it, surprisingly, it's not the very kind of basic juvenile high school structure to those sentences that all seem to be kind of the same length and saying the same thing. It's like, if you're an award-winning author, I'd imagine you'd say something a bit more creative than that. But okay, let, let's keep going. So in the English language, there's often a lot of words that mean basically the same thing. But depending on the context, it may be more appropriate to use one word rather than the other. And there's a lot of words for minor. We've got minor, juvenile, child, adolescent, teenager, uh, probably a ton more. Minor is a very 
legal word. It's almost like legal jargon. So a conversation that is casual and between partners is probably not gonna use vocabulary like that. It'd be much more appropriate for them to say, I'm underage or I'm a teenager or something like that. I'm a minor is just not correct for that situation. And it also has this very legal, a very serious connotation. For most of the English speaking world, including here in Australia, a minor in a sexual scenario is someone under the age of 16. So when Ama says I'm a minor in English, that means he's like 15. But of course that's not the case. He's actually 19, but you become an adult in Japan when you are 20. But again, this is a sexual situation, it's a sexual context. So it still doesn't even make sense because the age of consent in Japan is still 16. So because of this poor word choice, this conversation meant something completely different in English than it did in Japanese, most likely. Until I read on, I literally thought like a statutory rape had occurred. <laughs> The only reason I can think that the translator chose the word minor is because the word in Japanese, in the original Japanese manuscript, was quite literally minor. And there just wasn't any second thought given to like what is the most appropriate word there. And the decision that was made was what is the like most accurate word there. And sometimes the most accurate word is not the best word for communicating the meaning. When there's a good translation, and when I come on here and I talk about literature and translation and I say that the translation was really good, this is what I'm talking about. Everything was effortless. You couldn't even tell that it had been translated from some other language or that there was originally a different context. Everything is adapted so it's smooth and effortless to read. This was awkward to read. And this isn't the only line. This is something that Louis says about Shiba-san, the tattoo artist that she meets. His eyes were unnaturally brown and his skin was white. Almost as white as a Caucasian. Yeah, can you imagine um, reading that? in like a, a mainstream English novel. That would be on the front page of Twitter, really, as, as one of the worst lines of the year. The only reason I can think that Karashima would have put this in is because Kanehara literally wrote Caucasian in Katakana and he was just trying to be as accurate as possible. I think, in my opinion, this is the job of the translator, is not to do the most accurate transcription of the text. Because I, although I understand why they might do it, it loses like the clarity of the original manuscript. This book came out 20 years ago, so we don't have to have the conversation about how politically correct it is to say Caucasian. Like, it's not literally correct. He was as pale as a Caucasian. Well, Caucasian people, technically speaking, are like Georgians and Azerbaijans. I don't think they are notorious for how pale they are. I mean, People like me, who are not Caucasian, but are Northwestern European, which are probably the people that we're contextually we're talking about, are notoriously pale. But on a global stage, like, that is not known. <laughs> so I'm not going to say it's offensive, but I am going to say that it's unnatural. Why not? He was as pale as a European, or he was as pale as a foreigner, or he was even he was as pale as a white person. Like, that would still be awkward, <laughs> but he was as pale as a Caucasian is strange. <laughs> that just reads weird to me. There are more bad lines, but a lot of them don't seem to be, or don't give the impression that they are the result of a bad translation. Some of them just look like bad writing in general. For example, this is a line that really sounds like the original manuscript, and this line was absolutely <laughs> ripped to shreds in the Goodreads review. Everyone agreed that this was cringe. At one point, we have this exchange between Shiba-san and Louis. I think I might be a child of God, he said without changing his expression. Think about it. God has to be a sadist to give people life. So I guess you're saying Mary was a masochist. Guess so. Ugh. Rolling my eyes right now. I don't know how old Hitome Kanehara was when she wrote this. But you gotta admit, there's, some, there's something about this that seems so juvenile. Perhaps that's exactly why it was critically acclaimed. Perhaps the board of whoever decides who wins the Akutagawa Prize came to the conclusion that it's such an accurate um, portrayal of teenage life and that's why it's great. But in my opinion, it doesn't seem like an accurate portrayal of teenage life as much as it seems like an actual teenager wrote this. And maybe that's the beauty in it. Maybe that's why it's good. But for me, I can't get over the fact that it, it just sounds like a kid who has learned the word sadist for the first time and is trying to 
force it into their novel to seem interesting and cool. Because you know how we did that as kids. We'd learn a big word and it's like, I'm going to try and use that whenever possible. Look, there's been lots of cheesy, stupid lines and I can forgive those, but it just kind of gets worse. Like Louis's edition of So I Guess Mary with a Massacus just seems to take this from a bad line to a cringe metaphor that is really goofy and unnecessary, like just like that. I feel like I've been talking for ages, this is going to be a long video, but that is about all I have to say about the writing. But if you're okay with some spoilers of this novel, you may feel free to stick around because I'm going to talk about the plot and some of the problems and also some of the graces of the plot as well. So a lot of the conflict of this novel has to do with a love triangle between Ama, Louis, and Shiba-san, the tattoo artist. Alma obviously has some mental health problems, that much is the case, um, but him and Louis seem to be made for each other and they have a quite positive relationship in my opinion, considering everything and considering how toxic things are about to become, but still Louis has this affair with Shiba-san who is much more toxic and actually is a notorious sadomasochist, which is the context of that cringe line from earlier. But for a while, Ama seems to be, you know, a bit of a rough and tumble kind of guy. He's got like this punk look that the ladies love about him. But he seems to be fine, save for a few kind of mental health issues. But out of absolutely nowhere, a creepy guy kind of gets a little bit touchy-feely on the subway with Louis and Ama reacts by killing the man in cold blood and just legging it and then forgetting about it and acting like nothing happened. And weirdly enough, as the reader, we're kind of not positioned to react at all to this or see this as abnormal. Like, the, the situation is basically that, well, that's what happens on the tough, mean streets of Shinjuku, everyone. We have to kind of just accept that that weird guy got his comeuppance and there really isn't anything else to talk about except occasionally Louis does mention that eh, it would be a shame if like the police found out that it was Arma who did it and he was arrested and that. That would, that would put a spanner in the works but otherwise business as usual I guess. And that was so weird to me. <laughs> because sure, Louis and Arma are set up to be these kind of outcasts and these rebels and they kind of keep to themselves and they're kind of misanthropic and they don't need anyone else except each other and they're different. They're not like other girls, not like other guys. But sociopaths, I didn't see that. I didn't get that impression of them. So it was a really weird situation they found themselves in and a really weird reaction. And for a long time, I thought that this scene was completely stupid and existed for no reason except to be edgy. But luckily, it does actually serve a purpose. It does kind of foreshadow almost or plant a seed of doubt in the reader's mind for the kind of mystery at the end of this novel. This is the final spoiler warning. We're talking about the ending here. But in the last kind of like chapter or so, it is revealed that really unexpectedly, Arma never comes home from work and after about a day or two the police find his body in a river and reveal that he was tortured, raped and then killed and his body was discarded. Really random because he didn't have any enemies, he really only kept to himself. He just hung out at the apartment with Louis, sometimes they'd go drinking. They didn't really have any friends, they didn't really have any enemies, he usually just went to work. So like, what happened? We come to the assumption that it was something to do with like the gang of that guy that he killed. It's all coming together now. We have a suspect. We don't know who that man was or who his gang was, but we have a lead that the police don't and Louis is too afraid to tell anyone about in case she gets in trouble for being an accessory to murder. So everyone's trying to figure out the mystery of who killed Arma and we are the only ones who kind of know the answer that it has something to do with this gang. Or did it? <laughs> It could have been great, is what I'm saying. But it, it starts to fall apart. I will give Kanehara props for this. Throughout the kind of couple of days that follow Ama's murder, she drops the slightest blink and you'll miss it hints as to who the real killer is. Actually has nothing to do with those guys, but they are a good distraction for the people who are not paying close attention and are looking at all the small little details, a tiny little paper trail that makes it really abundantly obvious who actually killed Arma. It was absolutely brilliant. And I felt like this 
this is why this novel won the Akutagawa Prize. This really intelligent paper trail of clues and this mystery element at the end. It's then too bad that in the very last scene, Louis is handed a smoking gun, a piece of evidence that makes it abundantly clear to her and everyone reading it who the killer is, which is um, just a bit too convenient because like, where's the fun in that? I can no longer speculate, was it this guy that I thought it was? Or was it the guys who were the friend of the guys armor killed? Or was it someone else entirely? Yeah, no room for speculation. Um, it's just kind of revealed at the end in the most random way. It's just a little bit ridiculous considering how genius some of that foreshadowing was and how genius some of those clues were laid out for people who were only paying the utmost attention would discover. Because the smoking gun just ruined the whole thing. Like, because at, at that point, why even have that scene in which Arma kills that guy if it is confirmed without a shadow of a doubt in the last chapter that those guys had nothing to do with Arma's uh, uh, death <laughs> in the end? Why are they there? They don't do anything for the progression of the plot or the development of Arma or Louis or any of the characters because they're barely mentioned. The characters and the actions and the motivations are so inconsistent that I really went on this journey of kind of being entertained to thinking this is really going somewhere to thinking there's something actually quite genius happening here to just kind of at the end deciding like, well, I mean, that was interesting, but why did it win the Akutagawa Prize? It's really quite messy. I'll say that much. So in essence, what do I think of Snakes and Earrings by Hitome Kanehara? Well, I still stand by the assessment that it is not boring, it is well paced, it's a perfect length, it's not too long or too short, and I'm glad that it's not boring because a boring book written this poorly would be hell, like this would be a one star book. Um, but it's not. It's not boring. It's interesting. I was intrigued by what would happen next. And I think the mystery elements actually almost worked. Aside from that kind of mess up with the smoking gun evidence that just really doesn't make any sense in my mind. I don't know why it's there. It's not bad. I'm not going to tell you that it's bad. But I am disappointed, if not confused, by the writing and the translation particularly considering the reputation that this book has. I am still genuinely confused as to what the critics saw in this because a lot of Akutagawa Prize winners have gone on to be huge classics, not just in Japan, but the whole world. I just wonder what it is about this book that just put it at a level above all the others of that year because I don't see it. I don't see what the critics saw in it. But yeah, let me know what you think. And if you came to this video because you are interested in reading Snakes of Earrings and now feel a little bit turned off, don't worry. I think it's still worth checking out if you really think you'll enjoy it or it sounds like your kind of thing. I knew before going into it it wasn't going to be good because I'd read all those Goodreads reviews and they all said that it sucked. But I still found it wasn't that bad. I still think about it. I think about it enough to write about it and record about it. So it wasn't a waste of time or anything. I'd still give it a go if you're interested. But I think that's everything. I think this was a long video. Thank you for watching to the end. And that's all from me for today. Thank you. Goodbye.